Please rise and follow along with our confession of order of forgiveness. And happy birthday. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who forgives all of our sins, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are known and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your ways and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was given to die for you and for me. And for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Please pray with me. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy, live according to it, and grow in faith and hope and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Do we have a reader for this morning? Here we go. Oh, you, two weeks in a row. <laughs> well, it's, it's a tie between uh, Bob Van Horn and I, whoever gets here earlier. Oh. And he's not here. <laughs> so you win. The first scripture reading is from Romans chapter 8. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to the living according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption when we cry, Abba, Father. It is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, and heirs of God with joint heirs with Christ. If, in fact, <clears throat> we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to the futility, not of its own will, but, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now, and not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the, been the, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly while we wait for adoption, the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But what we hope for, but what, but if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. This morning's psalm is Psalm 86. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart to receive your name and revere it. I will thank you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart and glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the pit of death. The arrogant rise up against me, and a band of violent people make my life hard. They have, not, they have not been set before your eyes. 
But you, O Lord, are gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and full of kindness and truth. Turn to me and have mercy upon me. Give me the strength of your servant and save the child of your handmaiden. Show me a sign of your favor so that those who hate me may see you and be put to shame. Because you, O Lord, have helped and comforted me. This morning's gospel is from St. Matthew. It is the story of the sower of the seed. You will recognize it immediately. Jesus put before the crowd another parable. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field. But while everybody was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So when the plants came up and bore grain, the weeds appeared as well. And the slaves of the house owner came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? What then, do the, where do these weeds come from? And he answered, an enemy has done this. Then the slaves said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? But he replied, no, for in gathering the weeds, you would uproot the wheat along with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, collect the weeds first, and bind in them the bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and the disciples approached him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man, says Jesus. The field is this world, and the good seed are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. And just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. Then the Son of Man will send his angels, and they will collect some of them with fire, and there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. Let anyone who hears listen. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. To God's beloved children, grace and peace be with you. May the words of my mouth and meditation of our hearts bring you and I peace. And may God bless us and keep us and let his face shine upon us. Amen. Um, second to last sermon here. So we're going to just try to uh, continue where we're at. If we've been talking about things that I think are the most important. And the last couple of weeks was... was uh, Two, three weeks ago, it was about sin and how powerful it is and how we seem to either accept it as a given or don't fight against it or whatever. But sin is a powerful thing, and it destroys life and relationships. And then we started last week talking about the church, and this will be a continuation of that. I must begin with a... Hi, Jeff. Um... What I think is kind of funny, but you may not. Um, but then you, you don't understand the context from which I say this, so you, I don't I am born again. I am a born again Lutheran. You don't usually hear that. As a matter of fact, you don't hear it at all. Born again is associated with a different kind of branch of Christianity, a more conservative fundamentalist. Baptist, Jerry Falwell, Jimmy Carter, um, Pentecostal folks. They use that kind of language to talk about their relationship with Jesus. They, they were going along, and bam, they got bang, they got born again, and now the life has changed. Well, I did have one of those moments. I was a freshman in college. I did meet with some conservative folks. They did ask me if I would like uh, to believe in Jesus. I did already, but they said, would I like to make him Lord of my life and thus be born again? I had no real problem with that, and I did just that. Um, but Jesus wasn't particularly new to me. But for the next two or three years, I was with this group who had a, a sense of you need to take more responsibility to live a Christ-like life. It's really important that you live up to Jesus' expectations. 
And I don't know about you, but for me, that was kind of difficult. Not that I'm a terrible person. I'm not a terrible person. But Jesus has pretty high standards, pretty high standards that I could not always fulfill. And I tried the best that I could, but in, with God's spirit, um, but it, it was sometimes, at least for me, it was hard. And one of the things that was hard, particularly for me at that time, was not only trying to do God's will, but to understand it. That was equally difficult. Um, I thought I understood it, and for a couple years, uh, a particular person and I were very close, and we talked about getting married. But we didn't have the same will on one thing. She wanted to be a missionary to Japan, felt called by God to do that. And I didn't. As you can see where, where we ended up. That ended the relationship. And I could not figure out why God had given me this will to do one thing that didn't help in doing the other. In other words, why did I have the will to like this person but not have the will to go where she went? But I didn't. And so that confused me. And I was confused about that for a long time until I went into seminary. And seminary really helped me because it helped me find again the joy of the life of Christ I had as a kid. And I will give you an example of that. I attended your vacation Bible school this week just on Thursday. And it was for me a wonderful eye-opening experience, even though I'd been there the year before. The joy of the kids, it's simply outstanding. It's, it's brilliant. That I kind of expected. What I didn't really expect to see was the joy of the leaders. They were wonderful. Joyful, humble, caring, compassionate. Whether they cooked food or directed cars or did the lessons or dressed up or did recreation, or whatever it was, or the crafts, whatever it was. I went to each room, and I went, everyone was happy. It was a joyful, joyful event, which reminded me of me being a kid and going to vacation Bible school, which I did. And the only difference between the one I went to and the one you guys went to, we did it two weeks when I was a little kid. But I remembered that same sense of joy being gathered with friends and comfortable. I remembered it well. That's what the seminary did for me also. I do believe that you're supposed to take a responsible relationship with Jesus. I just don't know if I think it has to be intense. As if you make a mistake, you're damned. In my three or four years with the born-againers, that's what I felt. That if I didn't make the right call, I was in trouble. Now, I love Jesus, and I wanted to make the right call, but I didn't always do that. And I didn't remember the feeling of joy that I used to have as a kid in those three or four years. It came back in seminary. It came back probably because of the teachings that I grew up with. And as you did, I grew up with the teachings of Martin Luther. Upon working on this sermon, I came upon a youth who was raised Lutheran, who was a writer, and then came to a born-again experience later in his life, and he says this about Martin Luther. So he was, he was just like me. In April 1521, Martin Luther was brought before the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V, at the Diet of Worms, in which Luther was commanded to recant of his teachings. Luther refused to do famously stating. And what was his teaching? His teaching was that people were not saved by being Catholic. They were saved by Jesus Christ. That was his big teaching, and the Catholic Church wasn't at that time excited about that. Luther defended himself by saying, unless I am convinced by the testimony of Holy Scripture or by evident reason, 
I cannot believe neither a pope nor councils alone, as it is clear they have erred repeatedly and contradicted themselves. That wouldn't have gone over real big at the Diet of Worms. I consider myself convicted by the testimony of Holy Scripture, which is my basis. My conscience is captive to the word of God. Thus I cannot and will not recant. Here I stand. What he was saying was that it, his interpretation of Scripture was different than what he was being taught in seminary. And the basic difference was that God is for you, not against you. That God loves you more than he wants to judge a sinner. And that God desires to be in a continuing relationship with his people. Catholic Church kind of puts standards by which how to do that. And Luther thought there were no standards. He either loves you or he doesn't. And in Christ, he shows he does. The writer goes on to say, Martin Luther had long struggled with feelings of condemnation until his reading of scripture, particularly the book of Old Testament book of Habakkuk 2.4, which says, Behold, for the proud ones, that would be the Jews who had Yahweh as their father, your soul is not right with him, but the righteous will live by faith. Righteous living by faith, as opposed to living by works and responsibilities, but by faith. Luther continued his study as he was a professor and found out the New Testament, the story of Jesus, told the same story. And he used three main texts to suggest that in Romans, Hebrews, and Galatians, which basically says, the righteous live by faith. One of the great things that Luther did, and I'm not trying to tell you that Luther is an angel, he wasn't. But one of his biggest discoveries was that the people, the people who sat up just like you, didn't have access to scripture. And so while he was in hiding from the Catholic Church, it would be a little over a year because they were out looking for him, he translated the Old Testament, which is, which is Hebrew, and the New Testament, which is Greek, and Aramean. Jesus spoke Aram from a particular language. And he translated the whole scripture, and then because the printing press newly resolved and discovered, he was able to have the Bible put out into everyone's hands. And so the first time in all of the life of the church, people could read for themselves the story of God's love and find out what Luther thought what it meant to be a follower of Christ. I have before me the definition of what a Christian is to believe according to Wikipedia. It says this, Christians believe that God comes to us in Jesus Christ, a true human, humble and vulnerable. And Jesus lived among us to demonstrate his love. He is the grand news, the good news, that the promise of Jesus loves us and he will save us by his grace. And this promise was realized when Jesus died and was, was resurrected. As a result, now we live through grace because of faith. I have no problem with that definition. But listen to what the ELCA's definition is of a church believer. We believe that all people are imperfect and are saved, made right with God by God's gift, God's grace, grace through Jesus. There's no specific prayer you need to pray, no specific state of mind you need to have to achieve, and no good, need, good deed do you need to perform. We believe that through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has become one of us and took upon himself our sin and suffering that is in the world. God did this to demonstrate the love we are to have as we have received from God himself. We believe that we receive the gift of grace by faith alone on account of Christ. And we live in the tension of being sinful while still trusting, being sinful while being forgiven that God is at work in us. This gift of grace expresses God's unconditional love. And in response to that, we are set free to love. Uh, 
if you saw the two definitions, the Lutheran one was the one that I was attracted to because it emphasizes the sinful nature that God finds us in. And when he dies, he dies for all of us. Criticism of that belief, the Lutheran belief, was that it was called cheap grace. There's nothing you can do about it. And that's what we believe. There's nothing you and I can do to save ourselves. It's a gift of God. But it wasn't cheap. It cost someone his life. And it requires our wills to follow, which is another way that it's not cheap. But the sense of being freed to serve, being freed to love, and not worrying that you'll make a mistake and that you didn't interpret it right, that you didn't get the story right. That's what I felt like from, for three years, that I wasn't living up perfectly to the story as I interpreted it. Becoming Lutheran helped me, again, being born again Lutheran, to get away from that and emphasize his love even though I am a sinner and that he's not upstairs keeping record. But it also taught me to love more broadly and greater. When I was with Campus Crusade or the Baptists or the Pentecostals, we would always read all the time someone would quote this, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. As a Lutheran, it is read like this. For by grace you have been loved through faith is a gift of God. God did not send his son to condemn us, but to redeem us. That's John 3, 17. God's love is more important than any sense of condemnation. He didn't come down to destroy us. He came down to live with us now and eternally. And we, formed by that grace, are to give that to the world. Which leads to this final story. 1985, three years into the ministry, I got married. And my wife had gotten a new job. She just became a nurse practitioner. New job with Carolyn Downs, which was on top of Capitol Hill. And she always wanted to work with, with people in need like that. It was a low-income area, and that's what she did. And her boss, i.e. medical provider, because she was a nurse practitioner, was an MD named Michael. And Michael came to our wedding, and Michael was just, just wonderful. But Michael revealed something to me that I had never known before. Michael had AIDS, and I had never been exposed to that. I didn't even know what it really was. And I can tell you that in terms of uh, homosexuality, I never met a homosexual that admitted it uh, in my life. So here I am, brand new in the seminary ministry, and here we are. And I remembered my Campus Crusade. I mean, we were told to not associate with sinners. We were told that over and over again because it'll rub off on you. And here I am, bam, right next to it. What do I do? Well, of course, I invited him to church, but Michael didn't want to go to church because the church had closed its door on him. He was raised Catholic. And he was raised the faith of his own personal father, who was a military man. And the military man, upon finding out his son had AIDS, kicked him out. And if that was his father's church, he wanted nothing to do with it. Michael hadn't gone to church in probably 30 years and wasn't going to come to ours. We decided, Diane, who just fell in love with this guy because he is just simply a nice guy, a nice, caring, wonderful, great doctor, good sense of humor. He was fun to be with. He was enjoyable. I found myself liking him. As a matter of fact, I found myself really thinking highly of him. 
and yet he was dying of AIDS. And I wasn't exactly sure to do, what to do with that because he didn't want to come to church. So we decided we're just going to be, just heck, just be his friend. And I know in Campus Crusade or whoever I was with, they wouldn't do that. They would say avoid. Um, but I couldn't because the more I learned about him, the more I wanted to be with him eternally, the more I wanted him um, to believe. I just couldn't walk away from that. Diane and I were called to another church. We were over to Eastern Washington. We didn't see him for about six months. And he called one day to say, well, I know you have, you have your baby, your baby Jeremy. I want to come over and meet Jeremy. Okay, so he's going to take a weekend off, and he's going to come over to Waterville and, and see Jeremy and, and be with us. And he was coming over on Friday. On Thursday, we got a call from a friend of his that Michael won't be coming over. He's not feeling real good. As a matter of fact, we, we took him into the hospital. On Friday, we got a call from the same person that Michael is not going to survive the weekend. We were not ready for that. Our, the deal wasn't closed. He, we, we were scared what was going to happen. We offered through his friend uh, to come over the next day and basically pray with him and, and promise that we would take care of it. If there needed to be a service, we would do it. Diane would sing and we would do it so that his friends could gather and we would take care of that. She said, I'll, I'll offer that to, to Michael this afternoon. And she called back Saturday. She said, you don't need to. A Catholic priest showed up Friday afternoon, walked into his room. Michael told him that he was the last Catholic, and the priest asked if he could talk with him, and he was there for an hour. And at the end of the hour, according to the friend who called us, Michael took communion. And Michael acknowledged that he was not going to make it. And the priest offered a Catholic mass for him. And Michael accepted it. A man who had walked away from the Catholic Church was going to be remembered in the mass. The lady said, you don't have to come. We've got it taken care of. But if he gets a little better, we'll come on over. That was on the Saturday after Good Friday, before Easter. We did Easter in Waterville, came home with the message that Michael had died on Easter Sunday. And we remember celebrating that not only did Jesus rise on Easter, so did Michael. That's the work of the church. Amen. Please join us as we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Please rise if able or comfortable. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We shall continue with our prayers. And just a reminder to you, um, your future bishop, oh, your future pastor, is hopefully is going to be here this week and trying to confirm some housing situations. So please keep that in your prayers too. Thank you. Confident that God receives our joys and our concerns, let us offer our praise, prayers for the church, those in need, and all of creation. Each petition ends with the words, Hear us, O God. <clears throat> you are invited to respond. Your mercy is great. 
O oh God, you call your church to announce the gospel of reconciliation and truth, both near and far. Guide your church as it seeks your wisdom and shares it, trusting your spirit bearing witness among us. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. You desire peace among nations and peoples. Guard our neighborhoods from hatred, watch over police officers and firefighters, and teach us to advocate for those who live in fear. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You are gracious and merciful, comforting those who suffer any affliction. Sustain your people living with disease, provide shelter for all who are unhoused, and release any who are unjustly imprisoned. Hear us, O God, mercy is great. You name each of us as your children. Guide us at the Lord of life to welcome all, equip us for faithful living, and help us to enact the gospel in our community. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We present before you all those listed in our prayer concerns and celebrations. In this moment of silence, we name before you those whom you have placed upon our hearts. Hear us, O God, <clears throat> your mercy is great. You send faithful people to proclaim freedom from bondage and to renew your church. Encourage us by the witness of the faithfully departed so that we live into that same hope. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Into your hands, O God, we commend all whom we pray in the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace, Lord, be with you all. May you take a moment to share God's peace with each other. We shall continue with the great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. After the supper, he lifted it up and he broke it. And he said, take and eat. This is my body shed for you and all people for forgiveness of sin. Do this in memory of me. And in the same manner, after the cup, after the supper, he took the cup and he lifted it up and he gave it for all the drink, saying, drink ye this cup, for this cup is the covenant of my blood. It is shed for you and all people for forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, ascension, and his coming again in glory. We pray, pour out upon us, O Lord, the spirit of your love, and unite the wills of all who share in this heavenly food, the body and the blood of Christ, shed for you and all people with you and the Holy Spirit be given all honor, glory, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And see us. the body of Jesus Christ given for you and for me for forgiveness of our sins. The blood of Christ shed for you and I. And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ keep you and keep you in his grace. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you his peace. May the Lord grant you his love, hope, and with his dying breath, his grace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.